The FBI starts to get closely interested in the blind sheik, as a number of tapes containing his sermons are discovered in the home of El Sayyid Nasir, Rabbi Kahani's killer. It was, um, it was extremely, extremely difficult um, to get very close information. We developed a, a lot of information from the people on the outside looking in, uh, but we were having a lot of trouble uh, developing first-hand information from his inner circle. The FBI decides to increase its surveillance of the Sheik, even managing to infiltrate his immediate circle, thanks to Ahmad Salem, the terrorist bomb maker who in reality is an undercover FBI agent, who manages to infiltrate the group and blend with the Sheik's faithful. Fearing retaliation, the man, whose name at the time was Imad Salem, has since changed identities and now lives in hiding. John Antisev, Agent John, one day came to me with Agent Nancy Floyd and they said, we have a picture, we want to show it to you. Do you know this man? I said, of course, this is Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. Who is Sheikh Omar? I said, he is the one who ordered the assassination of my president. Oh. Well, guess what? He is in America. I said, it's a surprise for me because I know that since he escaped from Egypt, he is being listed on the terrorist lists and he should not be in, in any country. They said, well, somehow he managed to come to America and <clears throat> he lives in New Jersey. To this day, I don't know why um, the blind Sheikh was issued a U.S. visa to come to the United States. It's never been adequately explained. I don't think even the 9-11 Commission was able to get to the bottom of it. Imad Salem gradually becomes part of the blind Sheikh's inner circle. Imad continues to spend time with Islamist groups tied to the al Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn and to El Nusayr. Now totally infiltrated into the group, he cannot turn back. I was in Brooklyn with Ibrahim El Gabroni. Ibrahim El Gabroni is Sayyid Nusser's cousin. He said that um, we should start to do something, brother, so the government have some pressure and <clears throat> they don't put Sayyid, brother Sayyid in more troubles. So I said, sure, of course, we should do something. He said, okay, um, do you know how to build a bomb? I said, of course, that's what we do. He said, okay, I want you to build some bombs and uh, I'll tell you later, what do you need? I need, so I said to Ibrahim El Gabroni, I need uh, explosives, I need detonators, um, I need people to help me build the bombs, I need a safe place to build the bomb in. He said, okay, let me make some phone calls to Afghanistan as an intelligence asset, what we say in our business. He was made promises that he did not have to testify in any type of criminal proceedings. And that's the way we, when we took him, we did not dispute that, knowing that at the time this would never go, uh, there wouldn't be an issue anytime soon. So when he started getting involved with uh, talks of assassinations and pipe bombs, of course, we had to change gears, and we had to go from an intelligence gathering uh, operation to a criminal investigation and gathering evidence trying to, to arrest these people. At this moment in time, the number one witness against everybody is Imad Salem himself, and he did not want to testify. And we were trying to convince Imad to wear a wire so when he met with these people and talked about assassinations and killings and pipe bombs, that he would record the conversations of the people. And he refused. Like I said, very stubborn, proud man. He wasn't going to be forced to do anything. And our superiors uh, wanted him to wear wire. And unfortunately, they got into a, a, uh, an issue of uh, who was going to be the stronger will. So they put it to him, uh, if you don't wear a wire, if you don't, you know, testify in court, we're not going to continue to pay you. It was a silly personal confrontation, and actually he said, and I quote him, 
you son of a bitch, coming from the Middle East, dragging sand in your shoes all the way up to here to tell me how to run my FBI and how to do my job? I told him, sir, I am doing your job. None of your agent could have went undercover that deep. I'm doing it. You're not. And that even provoked him more and he said, get out of here. I walked out of his office. I looked at Nancy and John. I said, guys, when this bomb been built by somebody and goes off by somebody else, don't come knock on my door. And that was it. And I walked away.